Good evening, everyone. My name is Vashadi Singh, and I'm going to be your host for this particular webinar. A universally celebrated artist, a celebrity, and a star performer, Geeta Chandran is synonymous with the Indian classical dance form Bharatnatyam. Now, as she completes over four decades in this field, she effortlessly catalyzes multiple vectors of creativity. She has extensively worked in the fields of television, film, theater, choreography, dance education, dance activism, and dance-based journalism. In recognition of her contribution and service to the human art and culture, she has received countless, countless awards. Uh, I'm just naming two of them here, the Glenn Gould Prize, which is the highest award conferred by the, Can by the Canadian government, and the Padma Shri Award given by the Honorable President of India. How fortunate are we all to have her in our midst today to talk to us about keeping our body and mind productive in the present scenario. I would like all of you to welcome her and we would love to hear from her. Uh, Geeta, ma'am, are you there? Vaishali, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you, Vaishali. Thank you, Manjula. And I can see a lot of others. Uh, Veena is there. Rita is there. Uh, I can't see too many of them, but um, I can see some of them. Uh, and um, Thank you so much for having me this uh, very warm afternoon in Delhi uh, when I'm sure all of you would have had a sumptuous meal and would have liked to sleep and when of course the Jingle Bells family wouldn't have you do that and um, rather have me uh, do jabber jabber with all of you and uh, bore you. Uh, but I don't plan to do that. I, I, I hope I don't do that. And I just make it uh, short, meaningful, and uh, something that, uh, some points that you can take back uh, on which you can think and on which you can maybe write as well. Because this is one new thing I have realized uh, that so many thoughts clutter my mind that, uh, I, after every two hours, I am jotting down points. And at the end of the day, I'm actually writing and writing a lot. And I think that's one thing I'd like all of you all to do to de-stress yourself and to, or if you want to speak into a recorder, whatever it is. The point is we are all at, at this time going through a churning. I'm not going through the entire gamut of how these difficult times these are and how challenging it is. Every day we get to hear it from 100 sources. So we know that it's challenging times. And uh, I think I can only go by my own experience. And I would like to share how I dealt with it uh, and how I feel there are no one solution to this whole issue because every everybody is in a different space and everybody has to find their own equilibrium because we're all thrown off suddenly and we have to find that equilibrium and that equilibrium will come I think out of many things uh, first one week for me was hell I didn't know what had hit me my classes had stopped all my programs were cancelled and I am one who had always had a bag packed ready for travel. And um, I used to never unpack that because traveling was part of my job. And I used to just travel so much, lining up rehearsals, traveling. And when I'm back catching up on teaching and being with my students. So this was a packed kind of a schedule I had for all the pre-COVID days, so to speak. This has become some kind of a... Um, a watershed of sorts and we're going to say pre and post. So, um, uh, so, so you can imagine suddenly I was at home, not doing anything. And uh, phone calls had stopped. Suddenly phones had stopped ringing. And um, I was wondering what's happening, you know, what, what, what is going on? And uh, then I think it was one of my students mother who they run the career launcher. And they said, 
Akka, why don't you? They all call me Akka, which is older sister in Tamil. So I'm referred to as Akka by everybody. So they said, uh, Akka, why don't you try a virtual class? And um, I said, uh, I've never done it before. And uh, how am I going to do it? So um, they set it up and they had the technical team with them as well. So they were monitoring it. And um, first I joined, then I became the host. Then I was told how I could share things on, the, uh, on my page. So the first class, she said, you were fantastic for a first timer. So that was the beginning. She said, uh, of course, I realized that I had about 20 students and they had 20 windows and it threw me off completely. And in dance, you can realize how it is when we do a rhythm sequence, everybody had different speeds of Wi-Fi. And I had literally 20 speeds in front of me and I was saying it in one speed. You could imagine the confusion, the chaos. And I said, what am I got into? You know, what is happening? But I was thrown into the deep seas and I said, I have to see what is happening. So I th I'm sure many of you had the same experience, people who have not attempted to teach online. This would have been because nobody had any training to get into this. We were all thrown into it with no training whatsoever. We had to learn as we went along. So I started reading. I started listening to a lot of people. And I started sitting with it and examining what is effective on this medium. The fact is, we have to adapt. I cannot do a one and a half hour class the way I was doing it when my children came to me. I had to see, there were two, three things that I think all of you have to keep in mind when you're doing a virtual class. One is the child is not exclusively talking to you. He is in a home environment. The fridge opens and the eye goes there. Somebody else is entering the room, the eye goes there. I, it was so disturbing for me the first day. I said, what is happening? Then I realized that your communication has to be so powerful and so engaging that the child is oblivious of the environment. This is one big lesson I learned, which means it takes double the energy on a virtual platform to take a class. I was not using a mic. In just two days, I lost my voice because I was shouting and screaming, not screaming at my children, but I wanted their attention because of which I, without my knowing, I was giving so much of energy that I was dead at the end of two classes. So then I started using a mic. I said, this would be better to at least save up my energy for other things and not just use my vocal cords to just get their attention. The second thing that I realized, so first is attention. The attention of the student can be got only if you are very engaging. You have to animate, you have to talk with your hands, you have to propel your voice. You have to take all your skills that you have of communication is very important and please be well-dressed. I think it's nice to have a pleasant face speaking to you rather than a dull face which has just got up from sleep and just come to take a class. No, I am very particular that my students dress up too for the class. They have to be exactly the way they come with their pigtails or with their single choti, with a one-one bangle in each hand, with their salwar kameez. I do the works because I think that is a discipline. You're coming into a virtual space of dance. You're not just coming into some space and just sitting there. This is a serious business and this is one and a half to two hours of learning, which you have to take seriously. So I think both ways that discipline has to be maintained where you actually are formal when you sit. And that's why you can see I'm dressed today as well to talk to all of you. Uh, so I think that's number one, communication. Number two, I realized is that the methodology of the teaching or the the, the sequencing of the teaching needs meticulous planning. 
because you have to start with a bang in the sense you have to start with a big idea so that the children get hooked to that so make a statement or something that is big in that lesson make that as a headline and then throw it on the children so that the curiosity then comes up you can't just read a lesson the way it is as it is so i think planning for a session is very important so i started breaking up my sessions into 15 15 minutes and i started saying what am i going to say in the first 15 minutes then the second 15 minutes then the third 15 minutes and the fourth 15 minutes and then about 15 to 20 minutes of question answers so i think a plan is very important and the first 15 minutes are very crucial whether you're going to get the attention of the student in the next 45 minutes or not so i think that first 15 minutes have to be extremely engaging either you make points and just flat read out those points or flash it on your screen whatever it is the curiosity of the child has to be increased so that's uh, the second point i'd like to share with all of you is that planning of the session you know earlier maybe i also went into the dance class thinking i am going to take it as it comes i'm going to see the energy level of the students i'm going to see the aptitude of the students and then i'll plan the class i should not necessarily plan it to the last t but nowadays i think i plan it i plan it much more than what i used to plan it before and in that i keep at least two elements for me for example particularly one audio element and one visual element because i realized that this is a challenge to actually reinvent our teaching methodology if you take it as a uh, a wall against which you have been pitched so be it otherwise you will see a lot of windows in that wall and try and use all those windows so i realized that uh, there was a lot of teaching material that i had never found the time to actually share with my children it could be in the form of a clip it could be in the form of best practices some great piece which has been rendered by some great artist or it could be just one of the bronzes in my house i would bring it show it to the students and talk about the symbolism and then ask them to write about it so for me it's a different subject so i really i'm i, I realize that i'm talking to physics maths history teachers across the board so i i'm i'm only talking what i did i think you will have to adapt it and translate it into your own disciplines but i felt that what i couldn't do in a real class i am able to do now i read poetry because i feel these are the things that lend themselves beautifully in a virtual class so you have to look at elements which help in this mode of teaching so that's the third point where you need to find out elements that can add value to just a lecture just a lecture i do not think goes down very well in this medium because after 10 to 12 minutes the attention span we are used to a commercial break so the mind just takes off and once it takes off to come back becomes difficult so i think you need to take that to keep up 10 to 12 minutes of talking and then break it with something it could be a joke it could be uh, something off the lesson and then bring them back and take them through the lesson so i think that has worked very well for me uh, particularly now there is uh, there seems to be much more synergy between visual arts between the word between music and dance because this was something i was not able to do in a real class so i have had experts talk to them about poetry i have had ashok chakradhar ji talk to them about poetry and rasa i've had another student's mother we've tapped all internal resource people uh, who came and talked about shala banjikas about uh, sculpture in the temples then another person talked about sociology and how history and sociology come together so we are trying to make it as uh, interesting as possible and as varied as possible because i think uh, uh, one hour of just talking becomes very hard on the teacher and on the student so i think what are the elements that you can bring in 
I think that it could be a drawing. It could be even the students asking one of the students to do a, 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 some kind of a depiction of what uh, you're going to teach. So I think models, all these work very well when it comes to the visual medium. And I think please use the resources available like in your YouTube and in other uh, spaces. It could be a TED talk. I think all these things add value. It's just that you need to kind of keep these tools ready for each of your subjects so that it adds value to what you are going to say in a particular class in a particular time. Uh, the next point that I, I have been personally observing is that if you say something very interesting, the whole family is engaged. I've seen grandmothers come in and attend the class. I have seen fathers who never knew what dance was and what the child was doing in the class coming and sitting behind or, you know, they, they feel very conscious to be seen in the, in the screen. So they are somewhere behind. But I know they are there because the child is giving glances like that of asking for approval for the pet from the parents. So I think there is a involvement of the entire family, which is very rare for us as teachers. So there's much more transparency in the teaching where they know what is it. They're understanding the difficulties on both sides and also appreciating what we are doing. So I think this is a great opportunity for us also to say how engaged we are in the whole process of disseminating our own knowledge base. So I'm very, very happy that, uh, you know, grandparents come up and say, oh, this song I have learned as a child when I was in school and now my granddaughter is learning it. I'm so happy. So I think there is an element of uh, uh, therapy that we are all engaged in and we are bringing in that joy particularly with dance and music, this is a plus, of course, maybe a maths teacher is not able to do this, but maybe uh, the other arts, arts teachers can definitely engage and bring happiness to uh, the entire family. So this has been very therapeutic for me to do the classes. The next point that, uh, of course, this is all through experience. This is not through any kind of a um, picked up knowledge. This is all my experience uh, turning a very difficult discipline like dance going virtual on it. Uh, the next point is most, most, most important. And I think all of you need to do that is first 10 minutes of our class is very, very rigorous physical exercise. Because I realize they're all becoming couch potatoes. There is no, uh, there is no flow of the day. There is no timetable. You are doing things very ad hoc as it comes along. And I think that can be the worst thing that can happen. Because many of the questions I realized what was given to me by, by Deepak sir were, how do I do this mind body fitness? How do I do, uh, you know, how do I get my maximum potential? There is no, it's not rocket science. It is following a timetable. You have to have a timetable for things. Just because you're at home, it doesn't mean you do things as and when. I think the time has to be fixed for every activity. And morning time, I feel before you start any of your classes or your lectures, you have to have at least half an hour of rigorous physical exercise. I will be very happy to circulate a video in case you want a video which can take part, which can take care of your entire body, particularly for the teachers. Because I think before telling the students anything, we teachers need to follow it. So I think first we need to do that. Saying that jadu pocha karti hu main, kapde dhoti hu, all that is fine. But there are specific exercises that, that, need, that have to be done to keep the body and mind fit. So the first thing you, at least the children need to do is a cardio, which means in place you need to jog for as long as you can, as long as you feel the breath is going very fast till then. For somebody it can be three minutes, for somebody it can be five minutes. It depends from person to person. The cardio is a must. And since we cannot go out, skipping is a great activity. 
skipping is very very good in place wherever there's a balcony there's something skipping is very good for cardio again to do so that you exercise the entire body those who are engaged in yoga please do the surya namaskar and now the surya namaskar doesn't mean you do it once you have to do at least a set which uh, comes up to 10 which means at least 10 surya namaskars or you hold every position 10 counts and then do it slow very slow that's also difficult so you have to do these activities which are absolutely non negotiable because you are not walking you are not taking up the stairs which you normally do in a school you are not running around you are not doing any of the regular activities and hence the tendency and if you are at home you eat more let's face it so i think exercise is absolutely important so i think the between the first week and the second week there's a sea change in my students and i tell you only if you exercise can you stay upbeat otherwise it's a downward spiral exercise is what makes you that metabolism needs that kick to feel good and only when you feel good i are, are you going to feel optimistic so i feel it's a vicious circle so the importance of exercise i'm again saying it cannot be that because you're doing other activity i will not exercise no whatever is your usual exercise that you do you cannot go to the gym the people who go to the gym are not going to be able to do it people who go to the playground are not going to be able so you have to find exercises of course there are enough apps available uh, um, on the net which you can see it's it's all guided uh, exercising whatever it is but half an hour to 40 minutes is completely not negotiable you need to do your stretches you need to do your cardio and that is the only you will see the difference you do it four days and you will see suddenly you have much more energy than you had when you were not doing it so i think this is something for the children of course but to increase the i think the the um, the potential of the teachers is also to exercise that would be my next suggestion and the last but not the least um my suggestion is that i don't think we could have got you know we will not be able to get through this whole uh, lockdown situation if we didn't have music dance films in our homes let's not underestimate the importance of the arts i have not seen a single person in the lockdown who has not listened to music or who has not moved around to a song or who has not read poetry or who has not engaged in some form of visual painting or anything like that more than ever before how much the arts are important and it's such a natural instinct for all of us which we are moving away from so arts are very very important again many questions that were sent to me were regarding how to um, uh you know convince parents when you see an extraordinary child having talent how to convince them to see uh sense in allowing them to follow the arts i think this is the time that they should realize that without the arts what would we have done in this lockdown if you didn't have poetry to read if you didn't have music to listen if you didn't have dance what would you have done i think we would have all rotted and we would have gone down in our uh, uh, emotional um, you know circle so i feel anybody any of the students who have extraordinary talent need fantastic training see the point is in our country people think they have talent and people think oh she is doing very nice dance to bollywood music and she can become a dancer no to become a dancer you need training you need exemplary training just talent doesn't get you anywhere talent has to be combined combined with very very sound training with lots and lots of hard work so i think the combination makes an artist 
So art, art is not something that if you have talent, you can make it. No, it's a combination of many things that makes an artist. So I feel that it should be understood in context. When uh, people from outside of India, foreign students come, they give up everything. They sell their property and buy ticket and come to be with a very good guru here. But what happens in our context is if the child is fantastic, the, the mother and the father will want the guru next door and say this auntie will teach and then expect that the dance, that, that the student should become uh, a Yamini Krishnamurti. That doesn't happen. When for engineering and for medicine, you are willing to, you know, kind of take so much of pains to send the child to an extraordinary university to, to you know, go through all the, you know, uh, troubles uh, that you can face uh, to, to make the child enter a great institution. Here, why do you expect things to fall on your lap? It's not happening. You have to find a guru. Guru is the most important thing that you can get. So you have to go to a good guru, continue your training, and only then can you actually see whether you are cut out to become a professional artist or not. So I think there's a big confusion and the trivialization of the arts, where you think the arts will just happen. Arts don't happen. Arts need to be worked out. Art needs to be really learned and practiced. And really that endurance has to be there. The staying power has to be there because the returns are not coming very early. There's a long gestation period. So arts are difficult to pursue all over the world. It's not just India. It's all over the world. Arts are difficult to pursue. So there are no easy uh, ways of uh, approaching the arts. So one needs to understand that and then step in. So the guidance also has to be correct when it comes to the arts. And uh, pursuing it just on the side is wonderful, but pursuing it as a full-time uh, vocation or profession is another thing. You need to have those kinds of inputs also so that you can then pursue. I don't know. I have kind of, I think, overstepped my time. Uh, no, not at all. No, no. You can are there any I think questions we have time. that I need to take? By Shali? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we had, Deepak sir had sent a couple of questions. I think you've covered uh, most of them. Yes. Uh, there was there was this one question about maintaining sort of a positive outlook in general. Like how do you maintain positivity when you know that, you know, such a pandemic has hit the world and there are people who are falling into depression because of that people are getting anxiety attacks. So how do you, at this point of time, how would you suggest that people, you know, stay positive? See, I am not saying this is an easy time. It's a very, very hard time. We all are realizing that it's going to be a very, very hard time and not just for a few months, but it's going to be for a few years. So I think the ones who are going to stay afloat are the ones who are open to innovation, open to adaptation. We should not want time to go back and say, why is it not the same as it was before? I think change is the only constant. If change is the only constant, then adapt adaptability is the only other next thing that we need to address. So if we leave what was and just concentrate on what is and what we can do, I think then the whole scenario changes, whole canvas changes, the whole ideas we want to hang on to what was. I think what was is gone. That was one period. Why don't we think that what we're going to get out of this is going to be even better? I feel it would be even better. I think interpersonal skills are improving. Family relationships are improving because you're forced to be together. Empathy is increasing, I feel because everybody is thinking of others and you're, 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 you're actually saying that I should not behave as though I'm entitled to anything. You suddenly realize you're not entitled to anything. If you come with, an, with, with, with the idea of humility and acceptance rather than entitlement, I think the whole scenario changes. So you are much better off than many, many others. This is the first lesson 
that this pandemic has taught us. That we are far, far fortunate and we have God to thank for so many things because we are not on the streets walking with our children. I think, imagine if I were to do that and if I had to do that. I honestly think every day, every moment, I'm full of gratitude because I am able to at least stay and do what I want to do and help many more others. I think it's not about yourself at this moment. It's also about how many others can you help? How many people can you pull out? Because everybody, as, as you say, is ridden with problems of different kinds. So you never know what you say, how it impacts somebody. And I've been told by parents that, Akka, after the class, the children are so happy. What is it in the class? I say there is no magic wand. It's, 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 it's firstly the continuity that you are there for them. Last 10 minutes, I talk to them. I just ask them what is happening. Just that much. So I think that empathy, which maybe I was not doing in a real class, you know? So it's deep. Actually, students, students have come much closer to me in a, because of the virtual class. In fact, I don't know whether they want to go back to the other class. <laughs> <laughs> and there is uh, one more there's one more question that came to my mind you uh, described very beautifully as to how educators and teachers you know should put in effort and how they should you know continue to teach in this virtual classroom that we have now what about the students what advice would you give the students what are they supposed to do and how are they supposed to you know match the effort that the teachers are making it's a very good question and i think yes the transition was equally difficult for them I realized because uh, because the first, uh, I think when we started in the first week, I was also learning. So I was pushing them to do pure dance, which is rhythm based dance. And it wasn't working. It just wasn't working. So then we realized that we are going to shift the whole thing into much more Abhinaya based so that they can do uh, things which I can teach much, much better on a screen than insisting on doing things um, uh, uh, the other way around. And as students, I think what has happened is, uh, first week there was no peer learning at all because there's a lot of peer learning in class. You know? After class, they used to sit for half an hour outside and discuss and you know, they were missing that. So one of them asked me, ma'am, uh, can we go on Zoom with the other class people separately? I said, of course, go. So now I realize that many of them have separate groups. They meet separately and they discuss dance, they discuss poetry, they discuss music, they discuss the films they've seen. So I think even that they have been, uh, you know, ingenious in enough to come out of, uh, come, come up and kind of fill in that gap of peer learning as well. So it's, it's amazing how you, they are also adapting. And I feel my lessons are much more uh, project based, which means if I show them a sculpture, they have to write about it. Some write about it, some draw, about, draw uh, um, a sketch. Some others have actually written poetry and read it out. So the, 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 the homework is of a very different kind. As I said, it's the coming together of the arts now much more than what it was before. So they're realizing that. And I have given them very specific tasks, tasks of reading uh, specific things. Like now we are doing a Mira, Mira Kapad. So uh, I've asked them to, to read, of course, Mira's life, but also read uh, a very important book from the uh, Oxford University Press, which is uh, Bhakti Voices, Three Bhakti Voices. So they're going to be doing Kabir, Mira, and Sur. They're going to be do, of course, I'm talking about the older children and we're going to have a debate on it. On, so, you know, it's, it's become, the learning has become of a different kind. It has become much more intellectual, I would say, much more reading based, much more discussion based. And we are trying to, as I said, tap on resources within the, the, the parent community to be sharing it with them so that it makes them write. I, and I, this, this exercise, they are all doing, they're all writing. They're all writing much more. They're writing about their experiences. They're writing about what they're going through. Because I think it's catharsis when you write. You know, for yourself. When you put it down, 
it's getting out of the system so those who have a problem with i think even with this being optimistic they should write please write you know whatever you feel you should write it's very important i think it helps ma'am you you mentioned uh, the collection of resources that you did and you know tapping into the internal resources that you have in your peer group and on your family friends that is one question that manjula ma'am has posed she she mentions that you have you've taken this time to sort of organize collate and document all the material that you had can you talk to us about that yes uh, you know uh, i call my house a kabad khana because simply because uh, over the years you know there's so much we've collected because uh, me my husband and my brother in law all of us are very fond of forms shapes colors textiles you know uh, really fascinates us so even any any small town we go to we go to the tateri there or we go to the the old old market in that city and go to the junk shops and see if there's any old button or anything there and and we you know kind of so over the years we collected so much and we've had uh, our grandmothers things with us and our ancestral things with us so um so you you can see the the lamps that are hanging here yeah they're beautiful yeah so um, so so i we've never had the time to enjoy them actually and uh, my my daughter said one day came and she said that uh, don't give me baggage you know all this i will just throw out Uh, um, uh, one day because this is all of no meaning to me so we raji when they got little worried about it and we said oh my god what is happening so this time we took to 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 kind of put it all together see and uh, build on the stories that we you know very often we didn't have money and we saw beautiful work and we paid it by installments and bought an bought an artwork so uh, so there are little stories to each of these little things that we had bought so um, we started writing all that down and um, of course for a month we shared it on facebook as well um, and um, there was there was lot of curiosity and i realized my own students they were walking in and out of the house but they themselves had not taken time to pause and see uh, these lovely things so they were saying oh god we've got to come back to the studio quickly i want to see this i want to see that so that curiosity became good for me because then i started saying that yes when you all come next you all need to go around see everything and um, see from where it is and what is the story associated with it so this has been a very very useful time for me to actually enjoy all this lovely stuff and also collate and write about it because uh, both rajiv and i have had the together we've never had the time to sit and actually some stories he remembered some stories i remembered and we put it down and of course there's lots more to do but i think now we moved on to books and archives because that's another section which is just lying like that half inch tapes and three three quarter inch tapes all that lying cds it's all you know there to to do so there's lot of work so i'm trying to do that as well and um, i mean books are just amazing i think i've really gone back to reading big time i didn't have that much of time to read earlier and now i think uh, uh, i think you need one more janma to actually um, understand and assimilate uh, the kind of knowledge base that our country has and i would definitely be want to be born again in india and maybe again be an artist a oh, beautiful ma'am uh, there is one question that i have from a teacher i think she, uh, she's asked that as as a teacher teaching on a in a virtual classroom how have you changed or how have you adapted the the evaluation techniques like how do you mark the students anymore uh, i am in a sense very blessed that i don't have to evaluate because i i see the student from where he was the, the previous class to the next class so the improvement is for the own students own graph so i really don't have parameters to judge a student in the sense i don't have to give marks out of 100 or i don't have 10 for so much 10 for so much 10 i don't think uh, i understand that evaluation on a virtual thing is extremely difficult because the ones who are 
um, expressive, speak, and they get away. That doesn't mean the one who cannot speak doesn't has not understood what you're saying. So it becomes very difficult to evaluate. I understand. I have really not thought about that, frankly, as to how to evaluate. Because for me, I think the clarity is for me to see how she was doing it before and how she's doing it now. So for me, the reference point is very different. It is uh, the comparison within the student and the improvement the student is showing. And that I'm able to e easily assess on uh, a virtual platform. But again, I don't have more than 20 students at a time. So I think I, I am able to pin each or each one of them at least once and see them properly and judge them for what they're doing. But it's not possible if you have 50 to 60 in a class. It's just not possible to individually see what the child is doing. So I think I have not thought of the evaluation part of it. You'll have to pardon me for that because I really don't know enough to say. Pam, uh, since we have you in our midst and you are literally one of the most esteemed authorities on Bharat Natyam in the entire world, like it would just be unfair if we let you go without a few questions on Bharat Natyam itself. So there's this one very interesting question that came up that what, how do you think that Bharat Natyam has influenced Indian culture so far? Uh, you know, it's very hard to talk about just Bharat Natyam in isolation because when you talk in India about the arts, uh, these are clusters, you know, so we, we talk about the classical dance scene or the folk, folk music, folk dance, folk theater, visual arts. You can't talk about, you can't say like how, how has uh, uh, Mithila paint, painting affected uh, the nation. So you say how is painting by and large influenced India. So here the question is how are the classical arts influenced India? That would be the question for me. Um, I think the classical arts bring together many, many elements, you know. So uh, it brings together poetry, mythology, music, rhythm, color, movement, facial expressions, um, uh, yogic positions, spirituality, philosophical thought. Uh, so I think it's, it's beautiful weaves, beautiful jewelry. So I think that, that you know, uh, it is a composite understanding of India, you know? So if you see a dance program, um, I think many of the, uh, the foreigners, as they see uh, a, a program, each one takes one or two elements because that's what engages them. So you dip into what you want to dip in this kaleidoscope of ideas and kaleidoscope of uh, uh, skills that are there in, in a dance performance. So I think uh, uh, that's how it's influenced people in terms of, and I have seen people actually being very, very moved after a dance performance. So dance can be a very moving experience. For some, it can be a very spiritual experience. For some others, it can be an extremely aesthetic experience. For some others, it can be a, a, a show of vigor. They like the vigor in the dance. Uh, so I think many people like the music in the dance, the poetry in the dance, some like the storytelling in the dance. So, you know, everybody sees different things in dance, what interests them and where they come from. So it's, uh, you, can, you can't say in terms of, uh, you know, sometimes people want facts and figures. Now I can't give you figures saying that classical dance has influenced X percent of people in X percent ways. No, it, it just, it is, it is something very intangible. It, it is something that touches you. It is something that is very transient as well, because you ex experience that particular thing for a short time and then it just goes. So it's very, very, um, uh, you know, a dancer creates and then does Visarjan there itself. Next day she has to again create and do Visarjan. So this creation and finishing creation and finishing this is this is a process that is continuous so i think the performing performing arts in india has always been viewed as part and parcel of life it's never seen as something outside of life so dance is really sharing experiences sharing your innermost feelings so it's a very very uh, you know complete form of art
Ma'am, how much do you think, uh, how much of the burden of reformation of a society lies on art? I, as I said, you know, if you have to get through difficult uh, times, through COVID times, you need music and dance. You can't get through it without that. If you didn't have music, what would have happened? If you didn't have dance, what would have happened? If you didn't have poetry, what would have happened? See, this is the thing. Uh, after World War, you know, the first thing that was ordered was to build a huge state-of-the-art theater. Yes. yes. So, you know, unless... Imagine a world without the arts. Imagine a world of just scientists and historians and everybody and no artist. Arts feed the soul. And unless the soul is happy and upbeat, you cannot live a full life. And what distinguishes human beings is this artistic creative spirit. So if we are devoid of that, I think it will be completely near us. There's no Ras. And Ras is the essence of life. Ras has to be there. There has to be that enjoyment in whatever you do. So I think without Ras, life can... That's why, you know, a, a teacher is excellent because the teacher has Ras while teaching. Ex teacher is not exciting because the, 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 uh, the, that teacher doesn't know the R of Rasa. So I think the Rasa is the essence. You have to enjoy yourself, and that enjoyment then has to be shared. If you don't know to enjoy yourself, what are you going to share? What joy are you going to share with the students? So I think you have to immerse yourself in Rasa. And you have to be that my, my teacher used to always say, fill yourself in rasa. And when you go and stand on stage, the rasa will flow out of you. So that immersive process of whatever you're doing, it has to be an immersive process. Thank you so much, ma'am. I have one question from Nisha, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Nisha, ma'am, would you like to ask that question yourself? Yeah, uh, I feel um, there is a lot of art is there within so many people which is hidden or never explored. So in the community of teachers and parents, how do we encourage? And I strongly believe this can solve a lot of the personal and emotional issues. So you are... Uh, so I'm going to express you something. Tomorrow I'm doing a workshop for one hour for non-dancers who've never danced in their lives. What is that? So it's yeah. never too late to dance. It's never too late to learn music. It's never too late to do things. So I think uh, this was a session that I was planning to do on the World Dance Day in Delhi. It, I was planning to do it live, but then that got cancelled. So tomorrow I'm doing it for one. So I think that hidden thing should not be kept hidden. You can, you can, you know, see everything doesn't need to be performed. You do things for yourself. You paint for yourself, you sing for yourself, you dance for yourself. So if it's a performing art, doesn't mean it has to be learned only to be performed. I actually have many, many people, older people learning dance saying, I was denied learning dance for so long. So now I want to learn dance, but ma'am, please don't feel under any pressure. I, ne I just they never want to perform. I'm learning dance for myself. So we have to understand that the performing ha arts have very many more dimensions. There is a therapeutic dimension. All two of my students who did psychology have gone into dance therapy. So many have go gone into movement analysis, just movement analysis. So everybody who learns music or dance doesn't have to perform. So they're very different ways of why you learn music or why you learn to paint, why you learn to dance. So I think you're very right, Nisha. I think many people feel, oh, I have missed the bus. Now I can't do anything. Now what? Ab, ab padke kya hoga? Ab padke kya hoga? Ab learn karke, learn apne le karte hai. Learn kisi aur ko dikhane ke liye nahi kar rahe hai. So you still have a, a teacher coming to your house and just learn. Learn to do it. Many people say, I want to do seva for Thakuji. 
I should be able to sing for Thakurji. So I want to learn to sing for Thakurji. Now, this is a, a, a reason far more important than to perform on stage. So I think there have to be reasons why you do things. Everybody has a very, very valid reason why. And for some people, it could just be catharsis. You know, as I say, you just come to a dance class and dance as though there's no tomorrow. And you feel you're out of all worries and all your problems. And you just come out a different person. So that you can do even in your own house, put on any music and just move and just dance. Whatever it is, nobody is seeing you. You just dance for yourself. I'm just listening to you say that is so liberating. Just and listening to you exactly, say it. Yeah, you know, and, and that's what exactly our bhajana traditions or our Sankirtan traditions did. Sankirtan kar would just dance. Where have they learned dance? They've not learned dance, but it's dance, dancing from within. The soul is dancing. So, you know, when you hear the kirtan or when you hear the call, you automatically jump and you automatically want to dance. So I think everybody has dance in them. It's just that you need to kind of get out of that inhibition that dance is something which is uh, for exhibition. No, it's not. Dance is just for your own joy, you move. That's dance. Ma'am, we have one question from Manjula, ma'am. Yes. Uh, ma'am, would you like to ask that yourself? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my, uh, whatever I have seen, read of our own, uh, you know, especially in the Hindu philosophy and the Hindu religion tradition, uh, also the, the temples, especially in South India, that I've been to, it seems to be very influenced by uh, classical dance. So I would like your opinion on this. Uh, see, the dance um, was part of temple ritual uh, in the South. And um, I feel that uh, because there were not so many invasions and so much break in the history, there was an un uninterrupted kind of a continuation of the tradition of temples, ritual, dance, music. Uh, it was an uninterrupted tradition, much more continuous than what was in the North. And because of that, we had great patrons of the art in terms of the Cholas and the, the, the subsequent dynasties which came. So the temple was the synosure of the status of a king for example, because here you see a temple is a small entity in the north. There, a temple is a few kilometers. And the entire city is defined by the temple. You have the north gate, you have the south gate, you have the east gate, and you have the west gate. And all your addresses are east gate, west gate. Addresses are all east gate. The center of the city is the temple, whether it is Madhura Meenakshi Amman or it's Chidambaram or it's Sanjavur, that's the way it is. So the temple was really not just a religious space, it was social, political, everything, the temple was the Sinoja. And so the temple uh, actually supported so many people, musicians, dancers, um, um, uh, uh, great thinkers. So uh, that's why I think dance, sculpture, because they, if you see the sculptures in the southern temple, there's no way that those sculptors wouldn't have learned dance or wouldn't have seen dance. So there is this beautiful saying that you say, if you want to sculpt, you have to learn dance. If you want to dance, you have to know music. If you want to know music, you have want to know poetry. So this is a, 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 a holistic kind of a scenario you had where in the uh, you know, the king supported everybody and everybody's art, everybody shared and everybody got ideas from each other. And it is a, it's a very, very, today we talk about interdisciplinary, but I think we come from a tradition which is so truly interdisciplinary. And hence, I think the sculptures you see there are so authentic and the, 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 the positions or, the, or, the, or, the, or even the hastas they take or even the dola, it's exactly what Nati Shastra says. So this give and take between arts is so obvious 
and it's so apparent when you see and the devadasis were such highly qualified so very um, accomplished women and they used to only dance in the temple for specific temple rituals and once or twice in a year they used to dance for the outside community when the temple festival was there otherwise it was only for the lord so it was a very different kind of a system and um, uh, they were very liberated women because they could have children and uh, they were married to the lord but they could have children from uh, uh, outside and the male members of the saivelar community used to, used to teach dance and accompany the dancer and the females used to do the offering in the temple so it is a very very organized system uh, which worked very well um, and whatever i have seen because my first teacher was from the saivelar community and she was a devadasi what i have seen of her extremely knowledgeable extremely generous extremely dedicated uh, women um, were the devadasis it's unfortunate that the whole system crumbled and they went into disrepute uh, ma'am we'll be taking one last question it's from kk mishra sir so would you like to ask your question I think he might be on mute. I'm just going to go ahead and ask his question. Uh, he asks that he feels uh, mental health is more required during this period. What more apart from art and music can we do? Because he feels that TV watching, especially, causes more stress. It does. I've started seeing the news only once in a day. Uh, I think TV needs to be just kept shut. Uh, because uh, it's just too much negative news all the time. and uh, i only listen to the 9 o'clock news in the night unless there's some breaking headlines that uh, one needs to see and uh, you know kind of keep abreast i i completely agree that uh, um, tv watching doesn't help in this uh, situation but reading you didn't mention reading you said dance you said music but reading and i feel watching nature you are allowed to go in your own road um the tree in front of me is a gulmohar tree full bloom and i am sure whichever area you are around 5 o'clock if you go outside the kind of birds that are coming nowadays it's just amazing it's a cackle you know there's so much of noise they're so busy flying and um, uh, it's so much fun to watch them that half an hour of godhuli time the dusk time please do go out and just stand and be part of this this complete symphony orchestra that's happening outside and listen to it and enjoy the birds enjoy the trees and and plants uh, i think nature can be a great great uplifter because nature has actually asked this time put us on pause and said i need this time to recuperate so let's mm -hmm. celebrate that and to see the moon it was full moon day before yesterday and it was glorious absolutely glorious so nature is i think you need to be more close to nature you need to talk to nature you need to read i think this whole thing of imagination of creativity we forgotten to be in a world when you read in a different world you can just go off somewhere when you read so i think those things need to be practiced more thank you so much ma'am uh, thank you so much for taking out the time to talk to all of us for sharing you know such wise words such wise advices your opinions they matter so much to us thank you so much for sharing it with us and i would also like to thank manjula ma'am for having this idea of organizing this i i will go out and say that you know this has been extremely educational for all of us i don't know i i just shared what i went through and what has been going on i don't know how useful it is for all of you but um, i just uh, hope all of you stay safe and all of you stay positive and stay happy full of rasa thank you ma'am thank you ma'am you i too. i see some of you not smiling at all <laughs> 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 i think laughter is a great great uh, uh, thing nowadays you need to just laugh
and you need to stay stay uh, happy so that uh, you can spread that happiness with the students thank you so much ma'am and at the end just no. a huge shout out shout out to the tech team which organized all of this and deepak sir thank you so much